this episode of Therapy Bites Art Lab. Welcome, T-Ballers, to another great episode of Therapy Bites Art Lab, which stands for Accurate Realistic Thinking and Life Affirming Beliefs. And do we have a treat for you today. When I was a kid, I just loved magic, and our special guest has some magic for you today that's going to embiggen your uh, relationship style in business and in life. Mr. Peter Anthony is joining us and he is a world-class consultant. And today on Therapy Bites, we will talk about Calabradabra, the magical psychology of communication. And we hope you join us then. Welcome to Therapy Bites Art Lab, where Dr. Heath and his special guests share real life stories of helping and healing. Fresh from the actual therapy couch, while taking a bite out of common counseling missteps and misconceptions. And now, here's Heath and the T-Ball team. Today on Therapy Bites Art Lab, thank you for joining us. We have our special guest, world-class uh, consultant and life coach and business coach, Peter Anthony, all the way across the many miles of oceans in the great country of Australia. Peter is an author, a speaker, a master in professional communication, and he has run workshops for thousands of people, many countries, dozen countries, 20 years of experience, Fortune 500 companies and everything in between. And he's here to talk to us today about Calabradabra, the magical psychology of collaborative communication. And Peter, thank you for being here. We're so very blessed to have you on the show today. And by the way, I want to say for our viewers who are watching on our YouTube channel, and uh, unfortunately our listeners can't see you, but when you and I first met, you had a different hairstyle because you had just climbed out of the ocean from swimming <laughs> with right. sharks. That's so cool. <laughs> That, that's right. One of the bizarre things I like to do each morning, uh, Doc, is uh, jump into the ocean and, and swim near where I live in, in Manly, uh, in Sydney, in Australia. It's uh, not quite shark infested. There are sharks in the ocean, as we all know, but it's a beautiful way to start the day. You get some exercise, you get the experience of being in nature, and you also get to catch up with some friends and colleagues. So now, I know a, this is off topic, but, to but for how long do you swim? Uh, for about 45 minutes. It depends wow. on the conditions because we're in the ocean and as we all know, the ocean changes depending upon how high the tide is, uh, how big the swells are. But we, sw we swim from Manly Beach to, to Shelley Beach, which is about, it's about uh, three quarters of a kilometre each way. So it's about one and a half k's altogether. Wow. Uh, and it, it's all condition dependent because wow. sometimes just and, getting and you know through the surf can be quite challenging. As you're saying, it's the ocean as well. I know the ocean changes. It kind of reminds me of how life is. Uh, life has swells and, and life changes. And I think that that puts a lot of stress on relationships uh, that require the glue. I kind of look at it as glue that holds us together. And that is uh, communication. So that's why we have yeah. you here today, world-class expert. We look forward to hearing your wisdom on this topic. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Uh, if you if you think about a relationship, you think about the high quality relationships you have, like whether uh, whether you're a therapist, whether you're a patient, whether you're a regular person walking down the street. You think, well, the people I have the best relationships with are typically the people I have the best conversations with, and you can look at a conversation as almost a barometer, if you like, uh, or a measure of how well the relationship's going. And if you're interested in a high quality life you'd be interested in having high quality relationships and therefore high quality conversations. And, and for me, it's a, they all, they all work together. And after working in this space now for around 20 years, I just see uh, one example after the other of uh, great relationships and great outcomes for both people being the result of having a, an effective collaborative conversation. Hence, I call it magic. There is a magic that happens. A magic in a relationship, magical outcomes, magical feelings when you are you're both contributing to a collaborative conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and that amazes me uh, what you're saying, and I completely agree. Uh, but what what really troubles me is number one, psychologically, and and this is kind of based on some research by one of my favorite social psychologists, uh, Robert Cialdini. Uh, he's he's the yep. person probably most responsible to trying to convince you to reuse your towels in hotel rooms, <laughs> and, and he's been quite <laughs> successful. 
uh, Robert Cialdini has at that is paid big bucks by the uh, hospitality industry. Uh, we all really want something from each other. I mean, it's, it's, it's not practical to believe that we don't want something from each other. Uh, you have a big background in sales, but what I was most fascinated about reading about your work is you soon found that the old sales model of just hammering for a sale was ineffective. And I think in some way we're all trying to sell each other something to get what we want. But uh, I don't know. I think you have a unique way of viewing, uh, you know, the process of carrying that out. Absolutely. Uh, what I've found, because I began uh, in sales as a salesperson and then became a person person that was running sales organizations and sales teams. And what I found was that the more I tried to sell, the less I sold, mm. uh, which is really quite, it's almost like a, a paradox. And it, yes. it, 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 it's weird because we get, we still get taught to sell and we still hear about traditional selling, like always be closing and all that, all those great cliches. But if you think about it, if you think about the last time you felt like you were being sold to, like you felt like you were being a buyer or somebody was selling something to you, whether that was a car or a refrigerator or a holiday, whatever it might be, how did you feel? Kind of icky. And it, it, you kind of feel, feel kind of icky. You feel like, well, I feel like, you know, backing away from this person, like getting some distance between me and them. I feel like I don't trust what they're saying. And I feel like I've got to, if I'm, I'm going to engage, I want to put downward pressure on prices and relationship. And that's the opposite of what we're looking towards doing. And uh, I, I understood that. But then I thought, well, if selling doesn't work, what does? Uh, and uh, what, what combination of, of moments or what combination of steps, if you like, um, need to be put in place so that not just I'm better off if I'm selling something, but we're both better off. And that's going to be, it's going to be good for you, good for me, and we're going to build a longer term relationship. And that's what started me on that um, journey, Doc, what, 20 years ago, to, to attempt to understand that question. Wow. Yeah, and, and I, I, uh, I'm, I'm kind of putty in your hands today, if you will, because I'll just tell you, if somebody, and I know I'm looking at it in a, a distorted way, but if someone told me you're going to have to quit your job and become a salesperson, I can't yeah. think of anything worse. <laughs> if you're, if you're going to sentence me to something that's punishing. And my point is, I think that there's lots of people that view sales that way. Mm -hmm. And it seems that your approach tends to disagree with that, that it's, it doesn't have to be a punishment uh, because of the collaborative process. Exactly, exactly. And, and in some ways, Doc, we're all selling something to somebody in some mm -hmm. way. Like we're, all, we're all offering a service or a product to each other that ideally is going to improve lives uh, or improve a particular situation. So we're all involved in transacting in some way. Even, even a, a doctor is selling medical services. I mean, and you think, well, uh, what's the best way to go about doing that? And you think, well, uh, it began with me with intentions uh, and thinking about what is my intention in this relationship? Um, if I'm, if I'm going to engage in a commercial relationship with somebody, what are my intentions? And uh, what I found and what the research suggests is that there's, there's three key intentions. One of them is an intention to collaborate and make it really obvious and really demonstrative that you're interested in a collaborative relationship. The second is a mindset of being optimistic that together we can make things uh, better uh, and different. Uh, and the third is being authentic, which is also opposite of traditional selling, being genuinely yourself. Uh, and if you look at the work of people like uh, Brene Brown, she talks a lot about this authenticity and having the courage to be yourself. And when she talks about courage, she talks about um, telling the story of who you are with your whole heart. So there's a there's an authentic, collaborative, optimistic intent to start. And uh, that's the fuel for the engine, if you like. You need to have those intentions. Does that make sense? It, it does. And as you're saying that, I'm thinking, of course, from a neuroscientific, a psychological perspective, because really in every conversation, it's almost inevitable 
uh, especially if we're not aware of the process, that I am uh, sharing something with you, trying to get something I desire, and there's nothing wrong with that. People use words such as uh, manipulation or controlling. Well, that's not manipulation or controlling. That, that's just that we, we, as you point out, Peter, we all want something, and it may not be I want you to give me all the money out of your, out of your bank account. It may be I want you to give me five <laughs> minutes of your time. Yep. It may be that I want you to check out this product that I have. Maybe it works for you, maybe it doesn't, but we're all trying to get things. But what we inevitably do is mind read. We, we think that we know what the other person is thinking, and we think that they're yep. going to be resistant, and we think they're going to be disrespectful, and we think they're going to toss us out on our ear instead of yeah. making the conversation. And I don't want to, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking maybe this is direction you're heading. Maybe not. You can let me know that what we really should do is look at how we can serve this person and maybe meet cool. this person's needs. Not so much uh, how does my product meet my needs and selling it, but how might I serve this person, whether it's, you know, I want some of your time, some of your attention, some of your resources, how, how we can serve them. Is that, is that headed in the right direction at all? Absolutely. I like the, I like the idea of service. Uh, and if you look at uh, there's, I mean, sales relationships uh, are one of the most researched relationships in the world, because obviously there's a, a big commercial imperative with big organizations to make big sales to big customers. And when, when customers are researched and they're asked, um, what are you looking for from this commercial relationship? The customer's number one need or number one answer to that question is, I want someone who uniquely understands my needs and my environment or demonstrates they uniquely understand my needs and my environment. So that's, that's, that is a, a service I am I need to understand what this person is looking for uniquely and that's mm -hmm. at the same time as understanding the needs I'm also developing the relationship because those two things are happening concurrently and it's very much a service it's very much a service and if that's the intent that people feel uh, and you are willing to willing and able to walk away because you can't serve in the way that that person needs service that's good too. It's, it's, it's almost more of a sorting process than a selling process. You're sorting out who the right, uh, what the right relationships are for you in a commercial sense. Ah, I see. Perspective. I, yeah. And I was wondering, you know, we talked a little bit about this last night, Peter, but we, we call it in therapy building rapport with a patient. Yeah. Um, but something that I was curious about, you know, we're, we're in a very techy world now, have you noticed that the tech has kind of changed the way that you have to, to build that relationship? So if it's by phone or by video, um, rather than just in person all the time? Yeah, it's, it's, it's changed. Great question. It's, it's changed a lot, Sarah. And it's interesting. I was looking at some research a few weeks ago from a, a global company that specializes in psychometrics and studying personality in, in, mm. in the business context. And what they'd found, uh, comparing pre-COVID to post-COVID was that uh, people were feeling more introverted uh, and more pessimistic uh, and less connected because, well, because of COVID and overlaying with the, the amp up in, uh, in social media relationships as opposed to personal relationships. Uh, it's definitely harder and we're having less of them. We're having, Apple research says that we're having less conversations than ever before. Uh, they fall, they've fallen every year since 2006. Uh, we're having less conversations and they're shorter and we're wow. uh, and pure research suggests that we've never been less likely to change our minds as a result of a conversation so for me it's really concerning you put that combination of things together we're feeling more alienated we're more dis we're less connected uh we were having relationships more virtually than in real life and we've never been less likely to change our minds uh, that's that must be concerning <laughs> that must you know it's, be. it's very concerning it, to it's very concerning yeah. to me. I mean, my, my, my question is, I mean, it, it, a pessimist might look at this and say, well, it's uh, the, the bell, if you will, the bell of, of, of technology has been rung and it cannot be unrung and we're on the slippery slope and there's really no way back. 
I, I wouldn't. Uh, I agree that you can't unring a bell, but I, I, um, I can't. Uh, I, I don't agree that um, that having less conversations and less human contact is a good thing. I mean, for me, if I look back through the even the evolution of human beings, we are. Uh, it's the essence of the of the of the evolutionary spirit, if you like, or the human spirit to connect and collaborate and belong together, whether that's in tribes or groups or teams or, or in couples, uh, that that's part of our humanity. And if, if we take that away, we're, we're definitely making a withdrawal that um, has more negatives than it has um, positive outcomes. I, I think I, I agree. I think that uh, that's, a you know, what I just said that, that I actually hear uh, a lot. It, I certainly hear it on social media. And I see all kinds of uh, very harmful symptoms coming about by that. That's that's a very fatalistic view. And I think what's called yeah. for is adaptation. And the question is, how do we adapt to technology, uh, distance-based ways of communicating? Well, what, I, what I'd suggest, or what I do suggest um, to your listeners to consider is, to consider every day having one more conversation, just adding a conversation to the to-do list, if you like. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm not, I'm not a luddite. I'm not anti-technology because I think, I think <laughs> it brings a, a, tre- a tremendous amount of benefits to us all. Uh, however, uh, if it means we're not having human contact, uh, we, we will all be worse off. And what I'd recommend is, uh, if, if you're listening there, think. Think about tomorrow. Think about one more conversation you could have. I don't mean like in a text message or in WhatsApp or in Facebook. I mean real life face to face conversations with somebody, and just reinvent that that art if you like, and uh, your life will change dramatically because there's something that that a face to face relationship gives you that a that a um, a social media relationship won't. Oh, absolutely. And here's a little bit of neuroscience for our listeners and watchers on our YouTube channel is you have, well, here's what you don't have. Uh, uh, as, as podcasters, it, it was quite difficult for us, us people who look in people's faces and eyeballs knee to knee every day, to go from yeah. that to staring into a camera. Mm. Uh, yes. it, it's, it's very hard for people to have a conversation with, a ca- with you uh, yeah. and, but all we see is a camera. Mm-hmm. I mean, literally yeah. right now, Sarah has a frame, and I'm, I'm actually looking at myself when, I, when I'm doing this. <laughs> but I would love to be looking at my, my viewers and listeners and mm-hmm. love to have all you guys over, and I'd make you a latte and some, or something. We'd have a conversation, and there's a reason for that. <laughs> Our brains do not have a gyrus. That's a, a structure in the brain, a gyrus, uh, called the uh, fusiform camera gyrus what it does have literally you can google it is the ffa which is the fusiform facial area otherwise known as the fusiform gyrus we have an area of the brain that is literally addicted to facial configurations and that's why when i hear peter's voice i really want to see his face you know i I am actually engineered to want to Look at look at Peter, and and that's why I love looking at different people. And I just want to say back to the uh, to the ocean swim, I could not have been more blown away, and that was the highlight of my day. All of a sudden, Peter comes up on my screen, and his hair looks like uh, what's the, what's the boxing promoter's name? Don. Uh, 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 Don King. Yeah, Don, Don King. King. You know, your hair sticking straight up. I thought that was fantastic, and. Uh, uh, but uh, but our, our brains are literally addicted to uh, to faces. There's so much power in that. And I think we give that up on social media. And, and by the way, there's a big correlation between giving that up and uh, anxiety. And there's a big correlation to giving that up. You know, the phrase is, what is it? Uh, 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 alone together. You know, you yeah. see kids, I shouldn't say kids, but, you know, younger people sitting around a table there may be 10 of them and they're not having eye contact they're all face to face with their cell phones mm-hmm. they are alone yeah. together or together alone mm-hmm. that's a very sad turn of yeah. events i believe yeah absolutely absolutely it, it is it is 
it, it's fascinating. And you, you think about, uh, if you think about the, uh, the decline in us having face-to-face -face relationships uh, and the rise in depression and anxiety in the world, and it's, it, they are happening, uh, they're happening together. And my, my view is that the reduction in human contact and being with people, seeing them face-to-face, -face, literally face-to-face, um, that's part of the reason why a lot of a lot of the world is is getting less happy year by year. And and but the great that's the bad news. The good news is there's a really simple antidote, and it's it's an evolutionary antidote. It's something that's very simple and easy to do, and that's just talk more with people face to face. It's that simple. Well, the question is then, and I, I have some definite ideas of my own. Uh, and I'd love to hear your ideas. The question is, if it's that simple, why don't people do it? What That's, gets in the way? Uh, well, I think I think I think you've hit one nail on the head, uh, Doc, and and that's uh, that's social media because there's so many platforms now. There's so many social media platforms. Everything from TikTok and Facebook to LinkedIn and a, a business context, you can you can uh, almost delude yourself into thinking you're having a relationship with someone by ah. being on social media with them. Mm. And I, I think it's, Excellent. I think that's, I, I think that's part of it. And that's been accelerated by COVID. And, and I guess your listeners from different parts of the world would have experienced COVID differently, but a lot of people experience more isolation as a result of COVID and more fear and more anxiety and more depression and mm -hmm. a whole lot of other, other challenges, which, and it's it's a natural part of when you're feeling anxious and stressed it's a natural uh response to withdraw from social support so to have less conversations but in fact uh what you will need is more not less conversations absolutely in terms yes. of your human, yeah yeah that, that, that's my that's my view uh, and uh and that's my mission if you like uh, that's my mission in life. And I know my mission in life, I've been tapped on the shoulder as the guy that needs to get out there and encourage the world to talk to each other more. Mm -hmm. What an amazing mission. And you just give me an idea for my next social media post. I've not seen this. <laughs> uh, you, you, you gave it to me. I need to credit you on this because I've, I've okay. literally, of uh, the thousands and thousands of posts that I've read and we've put up, I don't know, a few hundred of them, mm -hmm. is uh, somebody in my field Instead of instead of trying to loop people into consuming more and more of their information, have a meme that says, "Turn this darn thing off and yeah. go have off. a conversation." Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, go go talk to somebody and enjoy, yeah. enjoy the process. And, and you you've mentioned my swim in the morning, Doc. And one of the things I love about it is I get to catch up with people and in, in the morning. And we there's hundreds of us in in this in this group. And it, it's great to catch up with them and talk to them and, and, and understand where they are. And it's a, a perfect way to start the day. So that's, if, if I'm, that's, that's my mission. That, that's my, um, my Tom Cruise mission impossible. <laughs> mission impossible. <laughs> Should you choose to accept it. Mission, here's your mission. And then this laptop's going to self-destruct. <laughs> 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 that's a, that's what well, you know, the thing about social media, uh, the thing about screens is um, they really do key into how the brain works, uh, all the shiny, shiny, flashy lights and all that. It's, but, but it's a bit of a fib. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a Pied Piper mm -hmm. effect. You might, some of you that remember the childhood uh, uh, nursery tale of the Pied Piper where it's, it's singing a tune to you, but it's, not, it's just not good for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, it does light up some neurons. It does result in, uh, you know, a dopamine release and all that. But all dopamine releases are not created equal. You know, they can be faked. Uh, by the way, I mean, uh, the pharmaceutical industrial complex, they, they have plenty of drugs that can uh, cause synapses uh, to close, uh, circuits to complete. But, you know, there's an old movie commercial, a TV commercial called uh, uh, Memorex. Is, is it real or is it Memorex? And that's the problem with social media. It, it seems very real, but it's a bit of a fairy tale. Uh, no one lives that kind of life. 
Uh, a lot of this stuff is just junk, pseudo-psychological social media claptrap. And as Peter's pointing out, it's not real human connection, um, which, which gets to the point of why people don't do it. I think that, that the three A's come in here with social media. It's uh, affordable, available, and often anonymous. And with a real-life conversation, man, it's just all you. Mm-hmm. And so That's how right. do you teach people how to get good at that? <laughs> you had to get good at talking to each other. Um, but I think, I think <laughs> it, it's really weird. It's um, it's uh, my 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 mother uh, used to laugh at this because she she taught me when I was a I was a, a little boy sitting in my room reading my books. And I came from a big family, and she'd always have relatives coming over when I was a uh, when I was little, and I didn't want to talk to them. I just wanted to be in my room and read my books and just ignore them all. And she encouraged me to come out and and uh, and talk to my relatives and just ask them questions and listen to their stories. And I met some awesome people and developed some awesome relationships as a result of that. So I, I think that's a long answer to a short question. The, the place to start is to understand the importance of having more conversations, which is what we're doing now. It's it is really important for your own mental well-being and the mental well-being of the people around you and your ability to demonstrably uh, improve the lives of people that you're with, to have more conversations, more collaborative conversations face to face with other people. So we've cracked step one, which is the why. We've talked about some of the intentions, which the intention to collaborate, the intention to be optimistic, uh, and and the and the decision to be authentic. Then it's about recognizing the moments that matter in the conversation, uh, and the first of those, the first moment that matters happens before the conversation takes place. And that is you deciding on what the goal for that conversation is going to be. And the goal is going to be you thinking about what's going to be different at the end of that conversation, about what that person is thinking, um, what that person is doing or how that person is feeling. Not in a manipulative way, but in a in a, a genuine concern way to say what's uh, What's going to be different? How are they going to feel different? Are they going to feel more comfortable or confident or better about their lives as a result of talking to me? What are they going to know differently? Like how are they going to think or know differently? Or what are they going to do differently? And once you set that goal at the beginning, you think uh, that's going to be the the goal that we're moving towards. That's going to change the content of the conversation rather than just talking randomly about something, whatever comes up. Does that make sense? It does. That's it's, my it, yeah, yeah. And, and instead of uh, uh, asking what am I going to get, maybe a sale, uh, ask what can I bring to the table and what can I leave yeah, them yeah. with in a way that that is added meaningfully to their life once this conversation yeah. is over. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It, it could be a feeling goal. Like it may be my goal is to help them feel more comfortable and confident that uh, – I would like them to achieve their outcomes, or I'd like them to get something as a result of this relationship. So it it can be your goal could be giving them something. Or I, I often like to talk about the feeling goals, particularly with a lot of the men that I work with, because the men don't often think of a feeling as a goal. Huh. In fact, that I that I tend to think about feelings as much as my as my female clients do. And I say, hey, because that they think our oh, feelings like a not a masculine thing. You know, it's it's very masculine. Uh-huh. to help someone feel more confident and comfortable in your presence, to trust you. And you think if that's the goal, what sort of conversation will help them feel more comfortable with me? Now, I, I don't, I don't know goal. if this is off base, but the, the thought that comes to mind, uh, not to put men down because I'm very fond of men, I happen to be part of the crowd, <laughs> uh, is, that, is that men tend to be more destination oriented we just got to hurry up and get there instead of being processed finding value in the process Mm -hmm. welcome to social media smackdown tonight the irresistible force meets the illogical object ladies and gentlemen Let's get ready to reason! 
Doc Keith here with another segment of Social Media Smackdown. I've got my sock and boppers on here, but we're going to take the gloves off today for this one because this is such a big deal, and we see this communicated so often on social media, it's time to tackle it. This actually comes from a platform called MH Advocates. Imagine that. Someone labeling themselves as a mental health advocate posting such nonsense. And here's the post. Things not to say when someone communicates a trigger. Why are you making this into such a big deal? You're being dramatic. I guess you'll never be in a normal relationship. Well, I'm not them, so I don't understand why it's triggering. Wasn't that a long time ago? It was just a joke. Now, do I have a problem with calling people out on saying such things? Is, are those supportive things to say? No, they're not supportive things to say. Here's my point, though. My point, as I posted there, is that from a neurological perspective, here's why such posts are such a problem. They teach that others are in control of your responses and your perceptions, that we must walk around on eggshells uh, with some back pocket encyclopedia that tells us everything to avoid saying to others just on the off chance that they may disagree or not prefer us to say what we're saying. This is a sure way, folks, of burdening and sabotaging relationships. Please ignore these Kool-Aid drinking, pseudo-psychological nonsense posts spewed by so-called mental health advocates and these social accounts, this one in particular, that really just wants to sell you an app. Uh, don't farm out your being triggered to other people. Others are not triggering you. The thoughts are yours. It's up to you to decide what you want to think. If we go through life walking on eggshells, uh, self-censoring everything because we think we have some power to control what goes on in the vaults of other people's skulls, well, that makes for some very difficult relationships and sabotages relationships. Put on your sock and boppers like I have right here and sock and bop that nonsense out of your life. Have respectful, courteous, open conversations where free speech is valued and respect is a priority. Enjoy the rest of the episode. What a slobber knocker. The winner by Psychological Smackdown, Doug Heath. No pronouns were harmed during the production of this podcast. You're listening to Therapy Bites Art Lab. Bite-sized therapy for your brain with Dr. Heath and the T-Ball Tea. The best advice on the net. No copay required. Welcome to the Therapy Bites Art Lab Library, where we have poured over thousands of volumes to bring you the latest Couch Crumbs quote. Oh, would you like a napkin? You're getting crumbs in the book. That okay, me eat book. Oh. Um, 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 and now today's Couch Crumbs quote. Good evening. First, we engineer our thoughts. Then, our thoughts engineer our lives. A quote by Ducky. Good day. Oh, you got crumbs on the couch. Extra points for you. Here's he and the T-Ball team. Uh, I, I think, I mean, I do a lot of, in my coaching, I do a lot of psychometrics, Heath, and, uh, and I, uh, I, I see the difference in psychometrics between men and women all the time. And uh, one of the polarities we work with in the psychometrics is outcome focus, people focus ah. as, a, as, a, as, a, as a polarity. And typically, and I, I don't want to have a broad generalization, but typically I'll find the female clients I work with tend to be more uh, people orientated in terms of like traits like empathy and collaboration and intimacy in terms of one-on-one -on -one conversations, whereas the male clients tend to be more outcome focused and driven more to roles and jobs that have more uh, technical outcomes uh, involved in them. Now, that's a broad generalization, uh, but it's, it's definitely the case. And so what I find in working with male clients is I need to 
open them up to understanding that traits like empathy and collaboration are really important, uh, not just for others, but also for them. So they can be a fully expressed version of themselves. Now, now I don't mean for this to be a trick question, genuinely not a trick question, but I'm curious. Um, do you think that is, is it that um, one or the other is good or bad? Uh, pr- uh, 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 what, what were the two terms? Uh, people oriented versus outcome. Outcome yeah, oriented. People outcome. Do you think one yeah, is yeah. good or bad, or they just need to be balanced? They're both great traits, and they're both um, they're both required in different situations. I think it's a bit like having a um, when I talk to my clients, I say like, a bit like having a toolkit. Like one tool isn't good or bad. It's ah. it depends on what the situation is, uh, and if the situation involves a hammer, you've got a nail, use your hammer. Uh, I mean, if the if the situation involves a screw, use your screw. I mean, use a screwdriver. Use a different tool. Uh, so it's a matter of of, of being aware enough. Of the, what the situation requires, and then adaptable enough to pull the tool out that you need. Yeah, you don't want to and screw a be... nail or nail a screw. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it doesn't work you, well. You, you I think. I think the mystery is how it, do you? Actually, you could, it, it could nail a screw. You could give it a try. You could <laughs> try. Like, I'm, I'm well, try. I hate to say I have. Uh, it works. A hammer can nail in most anything, but it works better. <laughs> it works better if you use something for its given purpose. And and, and so my, my question is, how do you how do you cross train then? I mean, how do you cross train men to be more people oriented and maybe women sometimes that aren't so much maybe more outcome oriented? Well, I, I think it, it, it starts with it starts with awareness, becoming aware of or becoming a lot more aware of who you are and and how your personality or how your traits work for you that's that's step one and and step two is becoming super aware and this is a a, a great point sarah was making earlier about rapport uh, becoming super aware of who the other person is and transferring your attention onto them and onto their circumstances and situation and being smart enough and adaptable enough to adapt your approach to suit them uh, and what uh, what we find is that when you're willing and able to adapt your style to suit theirs they're much more willing and able to adapt their thinking to suit yours but you've got to make that investment first you know Stephen so Covey called that seek first to understand, to understand. before being understood mm-hmm. exactly I think it's exactly. habit number five and, and, Exactly, yeah, and I love Covey's work. Uh, I'm a huge fan of, of, of the Seven Habits, and that, that's true. Yeah, seek first to under, but but even before you seek to understand, you, you're you're making an investment in the relationship, saying, "Hey, I'm giving all, I'm giving you all my attention. I'm investing in you, and I'm willing, I'm willing and able to adjust the style of how I want to build this relationship with you, based on what you need." And they'll feel that. I mean, and this is. Uh, circling back to your point about virtual, when you're face to face, people feel it more. They f- can feel your presence more, which is why you can have more impact face to face, and you can build a better relationship face to face. I mean, it's very hard to hug someone virtually. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also, you know by the way, if if we were to stick uh, a person's head in an fMRI and do some real time imaging. Uh, there is just an explosion, a neurological explosion of electrical activity in the fusiform gyrus when you're seeing someone's face, uh, but also if they're a few feet uh, from where you are. It's, it's, it's a huge, just such a huge difference. It's so much more powerful. It's a huge difference. Yeah. And just yesterday afternoon, Doc, I, I was talking to a client of mine and I'm I'm heading up to Queensland next week to do some coaching, but just, just north of, of where I live. And uh, the last 40 coaching sessions I've had with this client have all been virtual. They've all, because I'm in New South Wales and they're in Queensland, so they've, they've all been through Zoom. And now I'm getting a chance to, um, to work with them face to face. And I've done both. I've done a lot of Zoom coaching and a lot of face to face coaching. And I know for a fact that uh, if you're in a coaching or therapeutic relationship, when you're face to face, you can have dramatically more impact on somebody's life than you can if it's virtual. It, it yeah. definitely 
it's better than nothing, but it's it's not it's not the same. It, it's a different sort of relationship. Well, it, it's an implicit yeah. process. Uh, implicit meaning beneath our level of conscious awareness, in that, you know, your brain knows that you're on social media. Uh, not yeah. uh, in a face-to-face encounter. The brain knows if you're on-site or off-site. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's better than nothing, but it does make a difference, and it has, I think, much more power yeah, if you can do it safely. Of course, you know, with COVID, that kind of threw a monkey in the ranch flying the ointment, and we had to do what we could. But uh, I, I've actually had patients that, you know, what, one of the diagnoses is, uh, that we see is uh, agoraphobia, which is a phobia, a, a, a belief that it is dangerous to me to get out in the world. And, and this was simply exacerbated by COVID. As safe as I was, I mean, I've, I've been in this business for 38 years, and every now and then it would be by phone call, but with COVID, everything went virtual. Everything went virtual. And I would not diagnose myself with agoraphobia, of course, but I will say that my brain is subject to patterns like everyone else's, and you can actually get into a pattern of behavior of what you pointed out earlier, Peter, of self-isolation. And for those listeners uh, curious about this, uh, you actually foreshorten your life. You actually foreshorten your life. Your brain is never more healthy than when it is adapting to new conversations with more and different people Mm -hmm. you can actually not only improve your lifestyle but your lifespan by these conversations that uh, peter's talking about today just imagine that you're saving your own life when you're having collaborative conversations yes and it's a great point you make doc too because if we if we think again about the the social media environment we're in it is uh, very much an echo chamber because the way the algorithms are set up, like on, on TikTok, for example, which is exploding globally, the TikTok algorithm is set up to feed you more of what you already know. Uh, uh, so you're hearing the same opinions, same voices, same people again and again and again and again and again. So it's not it's not expanding your horizons. It's it's really narrowing them and making you making us all uh, less likely to uh, be more expansive uh, in terms of who we're building relationships with and and what opinions we're learning from, what different types of people we're learning from. I mean, I I was, it was extraordinary. I I, I was uh, traveling to the the UK like four years ago and I just started talking to this woman alongside me and it it turned out that that she was a forensic archeologist and she was traveling to Bosnia to to dig up human remains to help put together a case to a war war crimes tribunal. I thought, I learned about forensic archaeology, war oh, wow. crimes, and a, a tremendous person on a mission uh, in her own way to change the world. Yeah. Uh, and I think I, I love that. I love that about the world that I can have a conversation with with you and Sarah right now, and with your listeners, and I can learn a ton, and I can meet a whole lot of new people, and it dramatically improves my life. So it's not all about giving away and not getting anything back. Um, uh, one of the reasons I like to think of uh, collaboration as being magic is that you both win. You both win and you both get a better outcome than you could by yourself. So no matter how selfish you are, you can be, if you're really, really selfish, collaborate because you'll get much more than if you don't. That's right. Mm-hmm. And, and something, a little philosophy I'll point out. This is more philosophy than psychology, neuropsychology, neuroscience. But just think of it this way, uh, based on what Peter said there that social media feeds you more and more and more of what you know, and this is a little neuroscience, therefore the less adaptive you become because there's nothing to adapt to. Mm. It's the same thing. Yeah. It's as if you didn't have a buffet of food, you only had mashed potatoes. And what is for breakfast? What is mashed potatoes? <laughs> well, what is for lunch? Oh, you guessed it, more mashed potatoes, and, and then our dessert is mashed potatoes, and our supper is mashed potatoes. And social media is nothing more than lots and lots and loads and loads of mashed potatoes. Mm-hmm. You become yeah. less diversified, less resilient, and uh, therefore less adaptive. Now, here's the second thought, and here's, here's the philosophical thought, that collaboration is more about valuing differences, I think, than discovering similarities. Because consider this, if you 
are just like the other person you're talking to in every way, as much as you think you may prefer that. If you're just a carbon copy of the way you look, the way you walk, the way you talk, the things you believe, the political views, then if you're exactly the same, then one of you becomes redundant and unnecessary. If you're on social media with a thousand of your closest friends, which is ridiculous, by the way, uh, there's no such thing, (laughs) then if it's a thousand, then uh, uh, 999 of you are unnecessary, redundant. The beautiful thing in life I've found, and why, by the way, I love Peter's uh, uh, first contact hairstyle so invigorating, is it was so different. I mean, can you imagine a worse world? And I don't need to get letters saying, yeah, Doc, you're right. Uh, Worse world than a world full of Doc Heaths. You all have my hairstyle. Yeah, look at that. It's I work very hard at it. The same glasses, the same shirt, the same accent, as wonderfully Southern as it is. I mean, what a boring uh, 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 world that would be. No, I love meeting different people because it challenges me to learn new things, but then also become more resilient. But it seems like, Peter, we live in a world that everybody just wants the same mashed potatoes. Yeah, and then you log log on to social media, and then you'll just hear people talking about how great mashed potatoes are. And you go, I'm right, I like mashed potatoes. Everyone else likes mashed potatoes. I'm going to vote for mashed potatoes. I want mashed potatoes to be president. That's all I'm hearing about is mashed potatoes. Uh, And... Every, everyone, everyone's worse off apart from people making mashed potatoes. That's right. <laughs> like right. That. so that that's that they're not going to. Uh, it, not it's 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 so bland, you know. It's it's yeah. just really so bland. Yeah. But 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 the the psychological reason there, by the way, and I think this is something that we have to point out to people so that they get over it, is the human brain is actually engineered to send us an alert when there is a difference in pattern to what we're accustomed or to what we expect. Okay, that alarm is okay. That alarm is normal. That alarm is not definitive. It is interpretive. It is up to you to hear a different dialect or voice or accent, to see a different facial configuration, uh, a, a different color of skin, a different political view. It's up to you to determine if it's a danger And if so, how big of a danger? Mm -hmm. Uh, Your alert system, your amygdala, little almond-shaped mechanism of the brain, so named because it's the same size and shape as an almond, uh, the root word uh, for amygdala uh, in Latin, uh, it's up to you to to, uh, uh, consider and to analyze, but is this really a threat? This is a difference, but is that difference a threat? And what I'm going to encourage you to do, unless the difference is, somebody pointing a gun at you, then it's not a threat. If the difference is not somebody holding a knife, then it's not a threat. I like to tell the story. I had a patient show up one day at my doorstep, one of these on-site in-person sessions, and this person was court-ordered. And uh, one of the more alarming episodes I've had, and this young man said to me, you know, Doc, I dreamed I stuck an F and axe in your head last night. Well, ding, 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 possible threat, possible threat. I look down at his hands, because that's typically where people hold axes is uh, in their hands, and he had no axe, therefore I evaluated that he was not a threat. And I said to him, come on in. Uh, by the way, never bring your axe to therapy. Uh, that will not work out well. We'll get much more done if you leave your axe at home. Mm -hmm. But we have to get over uh, assessing things as a danger to us just because it's different. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. And I think that there's two two really crucial um, parts there, Doc. Um, one one is the is the hyper awareness, and if, if I if I circle back to swimming in the ocean, uh, cl- oh, clearly uh, we, we're, we're swimming we're swimming in like in big swells and waves, and uh, the the waves reach reach a stage where if they're potentially a threat, you become hyper aware of the wave, like how big it is, where it's coming from, what size it is, what what size the other waves are around, and what sets are coming in, and people like me that swim regularly in surf and ocean. It reaches a level where you become hyper-aware. And that hyper-awareness is a gift because with that hyper-awareness, you can then make smarter decisions. It's the same when you're meeting with someone or having a conversation with someone that's different than you, 
you become more aware, hyper aware. And that hyper awareness uh, from your amygdala initially means that you can develop, you're then given the awareness to develop a great relationship with someone that's different than you and, and begin to get the benefits of that, that you won't get with someone that's very much the same as you that you have regular conversations with. You won't get that same level of attention awareness. And then you can make the decisions because you're, you're noticing more and you can make better decisions based on that hyper awareness that's taking place. And that again, circles back to Sarah's uh, thought about rapport. That's the beginning of the rapport piece when you first meet with the person. And that's a great feeling. Some people think it's stress and they withdraw, but it's not, it's not, it's not something to withdraw from. It's something just to stay and be aware of because as you become more aware, you can begin building the relationship and the person feels you're doing that. The person feels you're being more aware. Does that make sense? It, it does. And I love your turn. I love your discussion about hyper awareness. And I would offer maybe because a lot of people really catastrophize this. I look at it as a radar. And, and those of you listening can't can't see this, but I'm doing this in the air here uh, as, as I'm drawing like a big radar uh, screen on a chalkboard and it's usually very narrow maybe the size of a grapefruit but it can grow to the size of maybe yeah. a big hot air balloon but increased awareness as peter talks about is not a catastrophe and it's not a threat to you i would view it as increased awareness ability it's just a ability to be more aware but when you're more aware you can pick up more data which then is up to you to interpret what does this data mean. The mistake people make is uh, they interpret any uncomfortable data point as a threat to them. And I know a lot of clinicians uh, that with my patient, and, and you clinicians out there with your, you know, green as, as a brand new sapling, or if you're experienced as a tall old oak, listen up, because... Uh, you need to be safe. Yes, yes, yes. Safety first, but don't throw out, as my dad would say, the the baby with a proverbial bathwater. A lot of clinicians, this would have been the very last session they ever had with this patient. And the end of that story, by the way, is that particular patient still calls me to this day to thank me. I'm not bragging on myself. I'm really bragging on them because they made this message, this cognitive restructuring, this cognitive behavioral protocol their own, and it changed their life. And they would not have gotten that if I responded in a knee-jerk fashion and said, oh, well, collaboration's over, you've made a threat, I'm calling the police. No, 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 that's, that's, that's a bit over the top. Mm -hmm. Listen. This is where the pH, as my old beloved psych professor, Dr. Greg Murray, used to say, this is where the pH meets the D, and uh, you have to assess that, and we developed a wonderfully collaborative relationship, and this person's doing great, you know, I mean, I didn't, in the conversation, in the relationship, we continue to collaborate. Now, that doesn't mean I didn't set boundaries. I set one right away. Never bring your ax to therapy. Uh, <laughs> it's not a good idea uh but we continue to collaborate i find and, and peter tell me do you find do you find that people are too quick to sacrifice relationships if it doesn't work out right out of the gate yeah yeah well i, I think yeah i think that they make the decision before they even start the conversation they make the decision uh, oh, this person doesn't like me, doesn't want me, won't benefit from me, doesn't like my product or my service or my therapy, whatever it might be, and they don't even attempt to have the conversation in the first place. Ah. Um, so I think that's more of what I see. Um, in, and I'm working, I'm working with people every day in this space, and um, a lot of my mission is about encouraging them to have more of the conversations, and then when they're having more, here's how to have them better for both of you. Um, so that's what I see um, a lot of. What I also um, experience a lot, because we have, in the coaching and, and workshops that I run, we work, we say, here are the principles, let's apply them directly to your real life conversations to make it really practical and real for them. And I say, look, bring your most challenging conversations into the room if we're in a workshop or over in a coaching session, bring your most challenging conversations into the coaching session. And let's not talk theoretically. Let's look at the theory, terrific. But let's apply it directly to real life situations that you have. 
and they are surprised at how well it works. And uh, and uh, one of the key things to circle back to your point, uh, Doc, is they need to suspend their need to make a recommendation or be heard. Because people think, okay, that I've got their attention now, now I'm going to tell them what I want from them. <laughs> it's, it's no, 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 no. Um, as Covey did suggest, we've got to understand where they are first, like where they are emotionally, where they are, where they are, what they're thinking about and how they're thinking about that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, before yeah. we can, before it can move forward. Mm-hmm. And it's a lovely feeling to have someone that's genuinely interested in understanding how you feel and how you think. But I'd ask your listeners, when was the last time you felt that from somebody around you? It's pretty rare. Maybe in a therapy environment, a therapeutic environment, you might get it. But outside a therapeutic environment, it doesn't happen very often. So if you can give people that gift of being, wow, I'm really curious about understanding how you're feeling right now. I really love to understand how you make decisions about this. And I'm genuinely interested in understanding that. It's a lovely feeling. I was I had such a life. thing yesterday, but it didn't wind up being that lovely feeling. I was actually in a sales interaction <laughs> where I was the one trying to be sold. Uh, but it became clear to me that the company only just wanted what they wanted. They didn't really care about meeting my needs. They just yeah, were worried exactly. about their bottom line. And that was very exactly. alienating to me. I, I don't mind giving people money if you're going to yeah. meet a need that I have. But uh, they seem more concerned with just getting the sale than meeting a need. It was They were just in it exactly. for them. Yeah. So, we yeah, it's an, an understanding... Uh, understanding, uh, and this is crucial, uh, and this this is one of the key moments that matters you know, in a truly collaborative conversation, is uh, investing in understanding how they think or how they make decisions about what it is that you are talking about, whether it's cars or houses or axes or, or therapy, whatever it might be. <laughs> we, we, we've all got ways that we make decisions about things. Uh, and often, often it's quite subconscious. We don't consciously walk into the world with a whole lot of decision-making criteria in the front of our brains. We're often, it's often decisions we might have made 10 years ago about how to decide. Or it might be the way our mum did it or our dad did it or our sister or our brother did it. And we picked up decision-making criteria from somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's really important to unpack them and understand them and see and work with the person and say, hey, you know, are these criteria still working for you? Uh, and uh, how are they working? Would you, would you consider thinking about this differently? Because here are some great benefits you may experience if you did consider thinking differently. Oh, but you yes. can get to that stage, yeah, once you've built the trust in the relationship. You can't walk in with a, let's go, I'm, I'm going to change your mind. Yeah. It's, it, I mean, we all started, it, 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 we started off talking about, you know, everybody, you know, wants something. But, but you, you make a great point as we're nearing the end of the episode here, and that mm-hmm. is that, we all have patterns that we've developed about, you know, trying to have our needs met, trying to quote, you know, make the sale and that might've gotten us so far. But I think the beauty in what you do is you teach people that it may be time to evolve and to develop a new and better way of collaborating. And I think that's the magic of Collaboradabra. That's right. Beautifully, beautifully put, Doc. And, and, and what, what your listeners will find is that they will sell more when they stop selling. Yeah, yeah. As, as bizarre as that sounds. And oh, yeah. Sell it's, more. it's really counterintuitive. Yeah. Uh, but I think that the <laughs> old model of sales, no offense to those, Craig, the old model of sales, you know, whatever you're selling, uh, you know, whether it's widgets or vacuum cleaners or toaster ovens or a parenting technique, uh, even to your own children, is my dad had a word, and it, it, I thought he made it up, but I understand he probably didn't, called bass backwards. that, that, that we, we had a lot of things bass backwards about selling and about, you know, getting what we want, and it really needs to start off with meeting people's needs. Peter, any final words of wisdom you'd like to share with us uh, before we close out the episode? I mean, we could talk all day on this. This has been a great, a great collaboration, collaborative indeed. You've got me on a, on a mission. No, I don't have any... I don't have any uh, final words, um, Doc or Sarah, except just to encourage your listeners, uh, as I uh, suggested earlier, to think about tomorrow and think about who is someone in my life, whether my personal life or my professional life, who I can pick up the phone and see face to face and have a collaborative conversation with them. And every day 
decide to have one more conversation than he had the day before and just watch your life transform. Your commercial life, your therapeutic life, your life in general will transform dramatically in a positive way. Just have more conversations and have a collaborative intent. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Peter, for joining us. Uh, Collaboradabra, the secret psychology, the magical psychology of collaboration. And a parting word for me would be, folks, everyone has something that they need. And so it's really becomes more about focusing on the relationship instead of the Burger King mentality of having it your way. Often in relationships, you have a choice. You can have the relationship or you can have it your way. With collaborating and Peter's model of Collaboradabra, you can best get that through reaching out, seeking first to understand before being uh, uh, understood and collaborating and there's magic uh, right there in that interaction. It's up to you to go out there and find that magic in your day-to-day interactions. Thanks again, Peter. We look forward to having you on again sometime. All you T-ballers, Therapist Art Labbers, thank you for joining in, and we'll catch you on the next episode. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Okay. Bye. Hey, T-ballers. Thanks so much for being with us today. If we brought value to your day, show us some love by leaving your positive feedback and inviting some friends to listen in and join the T-Ball team. Next time on Therapy Bites Art Lab. Hey, T-Ballers, thank you for joining us today. We have a special treat for you. We have actually a surreal experience with world-class multiple author, motivational speaker, and just a super all-around person, author Kim Sorrell, talking about overcomers. The psychology of, I forgot what it's the psychology of. Uh, surviving and thriving. It's the psychology of surviving and thriving. Thank you, team. So join us on the next episode. Government legal gobbledygook. Therapy Bites is not intended as a diagnostic or as an alternative to professional clinical treatment. Resources and advice are for information and entertainment purposes only. Brought to you by someone saying things you don't like. Tape that nagging loudmouth shut. Government-approved speech tape. Gas tape. Now available at your local hardware store. Therapy Bites Heart Lab is not, not, not an approved, not, endorsed, not, not. authorized, butt-kissing affiliate of the United States Special Offense Assessment Police. Soap for short. Warning. Consumption of Therapy Bites Art Lab content by Kool-Aid drinking, stinking, thinking, social media, pseudo-psychological pushing, wacky woke, anti-free speech, mumbo jumbo advocates may cause spontaneous internal skull combustion, stomach discomfort, and or laxative effects. Allergy warning. Therapy Bites is manufactured in a facility that challenges nutty distortions, processes nuggets of accurate, realistic thinking, and life-affirming reliefs. This is the audio version of the legal fine print. Why are you still listening to this when you can catch the next great episode of Therapy Bites Art Lab with a good friend or family member? Really? Are you still there? (laughs) This is getting silly. Move on to the next psychologically thrilling episode of the best advice on the net. No copay required. Me eat copay. Yeah, with Dr. Heath and the T-Ball team. Go ahead. Don't be podgorophobic. Scoot, scoot, scoot. On to the next episode.